Great, so we are, we are recording. Um, so it's important that we record these meetings so that people in other time zones um, can actually watch these videos um, at, their, at their leisure. Um, so we're gonna be probably archiving this through YouTube or another platform and probably pro providing links from the Global Biofoundries Alliance webpage, which is on my, my screen currently. So the website for the Global Biofoundries Alliance is biofoundries.org. And I'll just bring to your attention, um, there is a, um, a contact link on the, on the header of the website. And um, within this, this contact page, um, you should be able to sign up for a, a newsletter for the Global Biofoundries Alliance or you can just send us a message. So those are, those are a couple of things um, to, to consider. Uh, so um, today, um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing um, my screen. Um, today, we're very lucky to, to, to be joined by um, Tiana Radivojevic, as well as Doug Densmore. And they're gonna be giving our, our two um, presentations today. We're gonna have Tiana uh, go first and we'll do maybe a five to 10 minute QA um, after Tiana, and then we're gonna go into Doug, and then he'll give his presentation, and then again, a, a follow-up um, Q&A. Um, we do have um, the ability um, for people to type in their Q&As um, kind of into the Q&A box within the Zoom um, platform. And um, if possible, at the end of the, um, uh, the presentations in the Q&A section, Fabian might be able to help turn on people's individual microphones if people um, have any questions and Fabian can maybe um, help us with some directions on how we're gonna do that. Um, but, but for now, um, Tiana, if you want to um, go ahead and share your screen, um, you can go ahead and start with your presentation. I hope you can see my, my slides. Yes, those are showing think, up. Great. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here with all of you. So today I will talk about the automated recommendation tool, ART, a tool that we developed within Agile Biofoundry to address the needs and characteristics of synthetic biology, which, is, um, which are the low number of training instances, recursive uh, design build test land cycles, and the need for uncertainty quantification. I will also show uh, some use cases and how ART integrates with other tools that have been developed within Agile Biofoundry. So synthetic biology expectations are high. Here we see the cover of The Economist in an uh, 2019 issue. Nevertheless, synthetic biology has already had an impact. Uh, remember insulin, for example and it has potential for a transformative impact in society. Uh, here are some of the more recent examples of applications of SimBio. Synthetic biology produces food. It has been uh, able to create burgers that taste like meat, but are entirely made of plants. Hoppy beer uh, without hops, zero calorie sweeteners. SimBio produces also fabrics such as spider silk, um, synthetic leather with uh, mycelium. Uh, it, it's also used to produce health products like human collagen, um, anti-malarial anti drug, artemisinin, and finally biofuels, uh, for example, farnesin, which is a diesel replacement that is used to propel the bus fleet in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and Symbio is also being used for space exploration. Nevertheless, uh, bioengineering is not easy. We gather data faster than ever, for example, through mass spectroscopy, microfluidic chips, uh, cell manipulation through lights and so on, but we need better predictive power. As uh, Tim Gardner put it, our ability to engineer predictable outcomes from biological systems remains infantile. And our approach to tackle this problem is by using machine learning. And for that purpose, we developed the automated recommendation tool. So what is ART? Uh, ART is geared towards leveraging the increasingly available um, amounts of data. 
And it produces a predictive model on one hand, which takes as an input set of input variables that can be, for example, proteomics, transcriptomics, promoter combinations, media components, or any other uh, process variables. And it requires an output or a response to the system, for example, of target molecule production, like biofuel. And it creates a predictive model uh, that says, for example, this protein profile has 10% of chance of producing 10 milligram per liter of the product. So it gives the predictions in terms of predictive probabilities. On the other hand, it provides recommendations for the next cycle. For example, you should decrease the expression of this protein in order to increase production and so on. Uh, art is, it has been published um, recently, so you can see more details in, in this paper. And for more information on how actually to use machine learning for metabolic engineering, there is a nice re review we recently put out. And here is an example of how um, art bridges the learn and design phases of the DBTL cycle within um, Aja Biofoundry. So we use DIVA first to create strains, which we then put in the bioelector for fermentation that can take sa samples automatically. We send them to proteomics facilities. They uh, give us the data, which we collect and store into our experiment data depot. And from that data, we um, import them automatically from, from the um, data repository, we input the data automatically into ART, for example, which creates the model and tells what, what should be the next um, uh, strain design, which we again plug in DIVA and we repeat this cycle again and again in a systematic way. Um, how we store data, it is very important because if there is no data, there is no machine learning. We have developed the experiment data depot, so web-based software for storing uh, different types of omics data, metabolomics, proteomics, transcriptomics, OD, and can be used for different modeling purposes for data exploration. It provides interactive data visualization and stores both data and metadata. So it's our way to store data systematically in a centralized repository. Let me go now into an example of a use case for art. Um, in this study, we try to optimize the complexly regulated aromatic amino acid pathway that produces tryptophan in baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Tryptophan is, uh, is, an, is a molecule of interest because it is essential in humans. The body cannot synthesize it. Uh, it is also a biochemical precursor to serotonin, um, melatonin, and vitamin B3. This study has been uh, done in collaboration uh, with uh, Joint Bioenergy Institute, Center for Biosensibility in Denmark, and the Selagen from San Francisco, and we published the results recently in this paper. So what we did, um, first we, we were looking at the pathway designs uh, all the way from, from glucose to, to tryptophan, and we were interested in which promoters to use for tryptophan production. So we would like to be able to modify all the promoters in, uh, of all of the reactions, but since we are limited by the amount of promoters that we can use, what we did was to leverage mechanistic genome scale models and we use flux variability analysis to rank and, and select five reactions or genes that will have the most impact in the final yield. So after identifying these five reactions, uh, the strategy evolved four steps. So first, um, we removed the feedback regulation of tryptophan and created a biosensor that fluoresces given the amount of tryptophan. So this biosensor was ultimately uh, used to phenotypically characterize tryptophan flux in a high throughput fashion. So we used the rate of uh, GFP signal as the proxy for tryptophan productivity. We then used CRISPR to integrate the promoters and genes on the genome. So for each of the five genes, we had uh, six options for promoters, which gives total of about 7,800 possible genotypes. 
These promoters were replaced in a random way. So we created a library. We grew those strains in 96 well plates and measure the growth, OD and GFP. And um, we sequenced um, them to, to um, identify the genome for each specific instance. And finally, using art, we try to figure out what are the combinations of promoters that will increase the production. As this is biology, things don't work always as expected. So the number of samples to be used by art was limited by a variety of um, different errors in the process. So we had um, around 1700 samples, but uh, consisting of 81 time points. However, for some of them, uh, we didn't have the complete genotype information. Uh, the PCRs didn't work. For some of them, the assembly failed. Uh, some samples didn't grow enough. For some, we couldn't cure the plasmid out. Um, some samples didn't come from a single population. And all these uh, errors resulted in about 250 genotypes, which cover about 3.2% of all possible genotypes in the space. However, uh, looking at the library, uh, we realized that most promoters were well represented in the sample, which was uh, uh, good news. And the replicates were in very good agreement, indicating that uh, the excellent data quality. So this was a, a very good uh, data set, and that is a prerequisite for making machine learning work. When we look at the data for productivity, if you look at the each reaction, for these five, the production is all over the place. You cannot really say much except for maybe gene three for which promoter four um, was uh, resulted in high production levels. But we expected R to find underlying dependencies of promoter combinations that would result in higher production levels. So we trained art which is basically an ensemble of uh, several individual machine learning models. And what we got is the, uh, th these are the metrics for, from this data set. And it turns out that the, the art ensemble model, the final model outperforms all individual models that are a set of scikit-learn models. And here we see how um, cross-validated predictions um, relate to the observations. Finally, R suggested new promoter designs uh, by leveraging this data. And we provided a set of promoter combinations on the left that they, um, um, our collaborators in Denmark went, went back to the lab and constructed. Um, the middle graph shows the representation of, um, of each of the promoters in the library. So some of these recommendations um, were examples of anticipated results, but others were non-intuitive predictions. And uh, our predictions were given in terms of uh, probabilities. So we had the full range of um, um, uncertainty for, for each of the recommendation. And finally, here we see the set of the um, uh, library strains in gray and art recommendations in blue. And it turns out that the best art recommendation improved productivity by 17% over the best one in the library and 106% over the optimized reference strain by using um, the combination of machine learning and genome scale models. Of course, in this case, uh, we only had five genes, but we could go with more. Uh, and ideally we would, uh, in that case, perform more than two DBTL cycles. Other examples um, where ARC had been applied were some uh, previously published studies. For example, uh, it was used to, um, balance the pathway for limonene production in E. coli by using proteomics data. It was used to hit metabolite targets for hopeless beer in Saccharomyces. And another example, which wasn't really a success story, uh, which we explain in, in the publication, was to improve the decanal production in E. coli. 
are, uh, has been, um, is being used also to design pathways and media compositions for a variety of organisms and, and target molecules. So um, in, in this particular case, I, I showed the promoter combinations and mentioned protomics, but that can be used for other types of variables that take part of the process. Uh, how, how we could use art. So art can be used uh, in two ways, through Jupyter Notebooks as a Python library or a web user interface. Uh, both of them have um, their advantages and drawbacks. Um, most important one being the coding experience. Uh, more information about how to use art and tutorials can be found on the art website. But I would like to, uh, I would like to point out that the, um, that there is a free non-commercial use for academic institutions, uh, but users should may should create an account at the art.agile500.org um, web user interface. Finally, um, I'd like to end uh, with the idea that machine learning, synthetic biology, and automation complement each other perfectly. Um, synthetic biology needs predictive power to enhance um, its global impact, and machine learning can provide the predictive power. However, it needs large amount of high quality data. So automation can provide the data required by machine learning uh, through the use of robotic stations, microfluidic chips, uh, cloud labs. And one of the examples of machine learning tools is automated recommendation tool, which is able to leverage the increasingly available amount of data that are present in modern synthetic biology. And um, as I showed, art can leverage machine learning to predict responses, for example, production of the molecule and suggest um, next steps. Finally, I would like to acknowledge uh, people who um, contributed to, to this work and uh, leave some time for questions. All right, thanks, Tiana. And um, I guess one thing is Masiek um, typed in a, a question to the Q&A um, panel. Um, Masiek, do you wanna just um, ask your question live if so and Fabian you can you can correct me if I'm wrong but but Masiak if you raise your hand then I probably can more easily find you in the attendees and then I can unmute you I think yep so let me let me see if I can unmute um, yes, that's correct <clears throat> if anyone raises their hand you, you're able to see them at the top of the list okay and I guess Masiak you're unmuted so you can you can talk you can just ask your question yes can you hear me yes yes perfect hi Yes, I was interested because you're saying art can recommend which promoter part exactly to use. And I was wondering, because the promoter parts are only as good as the sequence that stands behind them. And I was wondering if by representing the sequence in a specific way, could you recommend also the specific sequences and how to change them instead of just recommending parts to put there? Yes, that is possible with the caveat that we need, we would need larger amounts of data because in that case, we would need to know a uh, base space for each of the position in the, in the, in the promoter sequence. Mm -hmm. So in this case, it was, we had a case of categorical variables. So one of those uh, six promoters for each of the genes. So we had 30 promoters in total. So there were 30 variables present. Whereas in the, in the case of sequences, you will have much longer input vectors and mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. for dealing with those highly high dimensional data you would need larger data sets but absolutely this tool um, would be able to work with those so okay perfect that's that's great to know uh, and yes of course experimental space grows exponentially exactly. with the number of um base pairs that you have to recommend but yeah okay okay thank you um that's all that i wanted to know thanks Thanks, Masiek. And then the next question we have from, um, from Krishna. Krishna, um, I unmuted you. I think you can go ahead if you'd like. 
Right. Thank you. Uh, so, it was a great talk. I really enjoyed uh, listening to your talk and also um, reading the papers. And one of the questions I have is around the library size, right? Because you started with about seventeen hundred, and 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 it got whittled down to to half, almost half that number. And the question I have is. Third. Uh, third, yeah, third, yeah, exactly. So, so the question is, you know, how, um, uh, how much of a library size do you? What's the minimum library size do you need? Can you, can you, when you did the cross validation, did you do a scenario where you decrease the library size and saw, you know, how much can you push the the uh, the the library from which you can actually l- learn from? You know, can can you actually do it for less than five hundred or three hundred samples? You know. Very good question that we get uh, very often. So the answer goes, it depends on the problem. It depends on the difficulty of the problem because with, for some problems, the response um, surface is very smooth. So you can easily go to the solution. Depends on the number of uh, input variables. So how large is your input space? In this particular example, uh, we did have 250 finally genotypes, however, in the paper, we have a plot where we show the dependency on the how, how the accuracy improves by adding more data. And in this particular example, we learned that already about 100, we could achieve almost the same accuracy as with the full data set, 250. But this is something that cannot be known in advance. You would need to do some uh, prior exploration at least to realize what would be the size. So it always depends on the difficulty of the problem uh, on some hidden variables, on the size of your input space. But yeah, basically, uh, we try to follow uh, for studies that we have at hand. We try to um, address this question of could we have done, achieve the same accuracy with smaller data sets? Thank you. All right. Thanks for that, that question, Krishna. Um, now I am um, going to go to Rasmus Jensen, who had another question for you. Hey, uh, I think you kind of, uh, Rasmus Jensen here from, from Lanzasite, uh, I think you kind of answered the first part of my question uh, as in with what I expected, as it depends. Uh, I was wondering whether you mm-hmm. could comment on what you saw, if you've seen good correlations between wells and actual fermentations. and and how you would go about figuring that out. As, as in, have you seen a real good correlation or, or is that a sec- sec- separate step of optimization? Excuse me, can you say again, correlation between? Uh, well plates and fermentations. Uh, to be frank, we haven't uh, investigated that question in this particular study as, as far as I'm aware. Um, so, no, so, more, so, sorry. So, so, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, it's more like the, the end game here would obviously be a production. So, I was just wondering if, if you had any idea of that. Uh, yeah, well, the model definitely assumes that there were no um, differences between the, the from batch to batch, from play to play, from the person who was uh, preparing experiments. Uh, on a separate day, so we we could have take uh, these factors into account, but it wasn't done in this particular study. All right. So, so, so you, you. okay. Thanks, thanks, Rasmus. And I'm just going to re- reframe the question a little bit, Tiana. So let's say it's kind of like the input variables you had, like the strain used um, and the the production in a multi well plate, um, and then what you're trying to predict is its its production in like a bioreactor. So if you had that type of data, could you use ARTS to predict um, given kind of new strains in a microtriter plate, how well they're going to produce in a bioreactor? Could, could you use ART for something like that if you have the data? I'm not sure I completely understand the setup. Uh, if, if we would be, as long as we define the same uh, input space, so the variables that we would like to control, so different strains, um, different conditions, and we are optimizing the same variable, in this case, response productivity in the bioreactor. Um, aha, okay, so is the question uh, fermentations outside the bioreactor? And 
So maybe just maybe I'm just kind of not changing Rasmus's question, but the question would be, can we predict the scale up process? So if we can do experiments very easily in a micro titer plate, but we really are more interested in their production in a bioreactor, can you actually do a prediction there? And I think maybe part of Rasmus's question is how well do those types of experiments correlate? Okay, how I well see. Can you predict them? I see. The, this is something. This is something to investigate. Uh, it depends on the process itself, how well it scales um, on its own. If 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 the scaling is properly, then the model can be applied. Uh, if if the process is changed, then then we cannot rely on the model to predict. However, um, the models themselves do not provide accurate predictions. What they provide are the directions to go. For example, the, the, the exact levels that we predicted for tryptophan were not matched. However, the set of recommendations that was predicted to improve finally um, uh, proved to, to provide um, improved productivity in tryptophan. But the levels themselves were not achieved exactly. So the, the, the goal of this tool is to do multiple DBTL cycles and to guide us towards directions in which areas of the input space we should go and explore this in the next step. All right, thank you. Thanks, Tiana. Any, any other questions for, for Tiana? Feel free to type them into the Q&A or to just raise your hand and I can try to, to unmute you. All right, well, thank you very much, Tiana. Um, I'm sure people all. can follow up with you um, offline, um, especially for those people that are gonna be watching this from YouTube or from other platform um, later. Um, all right, so um, great. And then we're gonna move on to, to Doug. So Doug, you can go ahead and, and, and share your screen. All right, you can see that, Nathan? Looks good, yep. All right, well, thanks to the Global Biofoundry Alliance organizers for having me speak. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the DAMP Lab. Whenever I talk about the DAMP Lab, I always feel like people have heard about it, but then I realize looking at the attendees, I don't know that I recognize everyone's name, so maybe this will be new for some of you. So uh, let me just jump right into it. So, I run a lab at Boston University called CIDR, or the Cross Disciplinary Integration Design Automation Research. And it, the idea is that this lab would take my background, which is computer and electrical engineering, and apply techniques from that field to scale up biology. So these are tools that would think about how we can do things like specify designs, uh, then go ahead, design them, build them, test them, the same kind of design, build, test cycle, but I had an additional specification layer. And so what's shown on the left is I've made tools academically like Cello and Eugene, which take high level specifications and either constrain them in a variety of ways or compiled into DNA sequences. Then tools like Raven that then assembly plan them. And then tools like Puppeteer that then provide mechanisms for liquid handling robots to operate on those designs or this whole tool set called Fluigi, which make microfluidics. And we're gonna put these all together. The idea being someone like me, who's a computer or electrical engineer doesn't really wanna run a lab. So really, I just want to do this and then have someone else make it. So I kind of want to send it to the cloud. I want to say, OK, this is a design. Someone else make it. Someone else analyze it, et cetera. And there have been companies that think about these kinds of things, like Transcriptic, which is now Stratios, Emerald Cloud, et cetera. But the idea is, what would an academic version of that look like? And that's what the DAMP Lab is. The DAMP Lab is the academic cloud lab that complements my research effort. So it's a lab that I end up running, but the goal is long-term for it to be an independent organization. And in the context of this conversation, an independent member of the Global Biofoundry Alliance. And it not only does the experimental protocols that automate the biology that I showed on the left, but it also fabricates microfluidics, which can be the platform for many of these experiments. So that's what I'm gonna tell you about today. This picture, these are pictures of the newly created Rajan Kilachan Center for Integrated Life Science and Engineering. It doesn't look correct now because it's snowy outside, but this is what it kind of looks like. And there is a biological design center on the fourth and fifth floor there. This is kind of the floor plan. The DAMP lab has a couple sections. So it has a, a traditional experimental kind of bay-based rows of, of molecular biology equipment stations. That's called the DAMP lab north. And then in the south side of the building is the DAMP lab south. Now that's kind of a misnomer because I'll talk about later, this has actually become the BU Clinical Testing Lab this year and probably a bit of 2022. 
this BU does COVID testing with the lab and I'll talk about that. So we have a decent amount of square footage and, and it's gonna grow and we also have space for the microfluidics. So the idea is the DAMP lab is gonna do a couple of things that it has a research vision that what it does wanna do, unlike perhaps a, a commercial cloud lab, it does wanna do, it does want to think about developing new techniques, new protocols, thinking how microfluidics can be applied. So, and it'll do this through a series of internal and external collaborations and do research both in synthetic biology and microfluidics. But then it also needs to provide services. So what I'm gonna talk about is it's become a core facility. So in order to support itself financially, as well as provide kind of a proof of principle of many of its activities, it provides services. So it says to both internal and external people, if you wanna make use of the DAMP lab, you can do that either on a per service basis, or you can also do this on kind of a larger collaborative basis. And it provides that for microfluidic services and for synthetic biology services. And the focus really is on being automated, reproducing, doing standards, high throughput, et cetera. All the things I suspect most of the people on this call are excited to do. So again, if you were to go to the BU, the Boston University Charles River campus, you would look at the actual services that are provided by core facilities. You would find the DAMP lab. You could click on that link and you would see all the services that we provide along with uh, potential costs. I believe most of these costs are for internal folks. So there's an external rate as well, but these are the internal rates. And then we're also a member of the International Gene Synthesis Consortium. I'll talk a little bit about that, but that being, that is for any number of reasons, but not the least of which is we want to also start to think about how we can provide mechanisms to ensure that this is done safely and responsibly. So just a, a little, Overview of some of the services. If you were to go to DAMP Lab website, you'd see these little uh, QT cartoons, but they kind of outline the kinds of things we do. We provide different services for different robotic platforms. Um, we provide different cloning uh, techniques, a variety of these, anything from you know gel purifications, mRNA enrichment, different assembly technologies, the kinds of things you would expect a laboratory to do. We also do some fluorescence-based assays. We do storage, so people that might want to use this as a storage, uh, depending on if you're limited for those types of things, we can do that. And then we also provide some transcriptomics uh, work as well. So there's, we're expanding that. Those are the classes and flavors of services that we would provide. And we're looking to expand that. And I'll talk a little bit about how people in the GBA could help us expand that in 2021 and beyond, and how we would love to be able to prototype services with folks to make them available long-term for their research groups. So an example of one of the flows that might happen is someone would sit down outside of the damp lab perhaps and use a tool like Cello. So again, many of you may know what Cello is, but it's something that takes an input language called Verilog. It's something that's very familiar to the electrical engineering community. It then converts that to a genetic circuit. And then what will happen is they'll go through a series of tools, planning tools that say, how would we want to actually assemble that? And those individual assembly operations are protocols. And then what we run at the DAMP lab is we use the aquarium software suite developed by Eric Clavins at the University of Washington and others, where those protocols are, are stored in that system. And so a graph that says, use this protocol followed by this protocol, et cetera, that the upstream tools produce can then be stitched together through aquarium. And then that job would be executed. We'd capture the data and then we would return to the user depending on what they want they'd either get just the data back, this is how well your, your design ran or functioned or performed, but it also in the, in the event that they actually want physical material back, we can work with them in their material transfer process to get them that actual uh, DNA or that, that uh, sample back. So it's kind of that flow. You start, the point is you start in silico, it goes through an in silico and wetware process internally, and then re uh, results in a product. So some of the people that run this, we uh, some of you know Samuel. Samuel is kind of re leading up the research side in the head and some of the services. Then we have the microfluidic side run by one of my uh, graduate students, Ali. That will likely transfer to uh, another graduate student relatively soon. And the microfluidics coming in 2021 will provide a design service. I'll talk a little bit about that where you put in microfluidics you'd like made and we make them. But we have many other people that need to support this. We've recently brought William Jackson in uh, really to help lead a lot of the computational effort because that's really key to do all of this. And then we have some full-time technicians that are gonna provide a lot of the services that, that I'm talking about today. The vision though, on some level is that the DAMP Lab's day-to-day -day process is run by uh, interchangeable undergraduate technicians. And I don't mean interchangeable in a derogatory way. I mean that in, a, in, in the most 
the best engineering sense, that, that the operations and protocols are standardized to the extent that someone that's trained relatively quickly can run these in a standardized, repeatable way. Now, the reason I kind of put a caveat on that is because due to COVID and all of that, we haven't done much of that for the past year because we don't have a bunch of underground grads running around, but that's the vision. That it, what's nice is that provides, allows us in an academic sense to run relatively lean from a personnel standpoint, but also allows for turnover, which is an implicit part of academia. If you made a lab that required people to stay for 10 years, I don't think I'd uh, get anyone to join. These figures are figures that I love to show, and I've been talking about making these for the damp lab, but I haven't gotten around to it, but I just really love these. These are figures from McDonald's. And on the left is, you don't have to read this, but on the left is a chart that on the kind of Y axis are all the different meals you can get. And on the X axis are all the different ingredients. And it says to make a hamburger, it requires these ingredients and et cetera. And so it kind of is a resource allocation. It says for these uh, food or AK protocols, what processes need to be in place. And then on the right is the idea that if you're a, a McDonald's employee, there's a standardized process from the getting the bun all the way to delivering the hamburger to a person. And that is something that I think could be an interesting approach. So the damp lab has something similar. We're over these eight-ish, nine-ish classes of protocols shown by the different colors. So the different colors represent the different protocol classes that are shown in the bottom of those labels. We can say, given those, what resources do they require? And then this is an image, right? And this is kind of localized for the camera, but you could imagine this is uh, one of our lab technicians. I think this is Rita. Uh, the idea would you'd actually watch her moving around the lab. And if you did a time-lapse video, which we don't have zoomed out enough, you'd see her moving in the same track. It would look like she's moving like a robot along the same place because we have everything kind of in a standardized location. And we're trying to make it so that person looks a lot like that McDonald's assembly line so that as new people come in on a regular basis, uh, it's, it's very interchangeable and robust. It's a lot like the biofab, frankly, at the University of Washington has also tried to set up. So we're not the first to do this. We're just also trying to follow that paradigm. But in addition to humans, we want to have lots of robotics and we want this to be, now one approach is to have, we don't have the physical space to have as many robots as an industrial setting, but we think we, we do pretty well. So what's shown on the bottom are the things that we have. We have Opentron's robots, we have desktop mills for our microfluidics, we have self-free extraction devices. The video being shown is of one of our, our, our Hamilton robots going. The figure in the left is a large scale integrated system that looks like things like the iBioFab at the uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign that we would like to get. And it's kind of interesting, I'm not gonna dwell a lot on this, but getting that system has been difficult. But then when COVID hit, we got eight robots without having to do anything. So something I'll talk a little bit about is a little bit about what we might do after COVID is over and our robotics are no longer doing RTQPCR but maybe will be available to people like the GBA. So again, you can think of the DAMP lab as a place that's gonna have robotics expertise and is gonna help prototype and develop some of these things that could be disseminated to the community. So people ask me a little bit, and this, these aren't perfect, but people ask me what's the throughput or what possible, what's possible with the kind of DAMP lab? So on the left is a rough sense and it's really kind of back of the envelope. We, we'll keep refining these. But if you said, what's our throughput from an OT2 or a Hamilton, in 24 hours, we could do roughly 6,000 transformations with our, the numbers of OT robots we have from Opentrons. Hamilton, you know, 12.5 thousand. Again, there's manual intervention. Someone would need to run some of this, but this is potentially what could be done. We could, with the OT, upwards of 60,000 fragments, upwards of 125,000 fragments with the robots. So again, it gives us the ability to start thinking about what we might do if we had that throughput. And this is something that's been a challenge for me is to explain to a lot of biologists, well, what would you do with that scale up? Like people would say, we wanna use the damp lab to put one thing together. I'm like, you can do that, but that's probably not the best use of your time. This might be something you wanna do for library development. Or like Tiana was just saying, if we wanna actually start to do machine learning and we wanna build lots of things to get data, this might be a really, uh, a really great platform. Costs are relatively low. Those are kind of listed there. Uh, and we talk a little bit about how many operations we can do, et cetera. So that's kind of our, our throughput. On the other side, what you see is our, our CNC desktop mill for continuous flow droplet-based microfluidics, which has got a whole CAD flow as a whole separate talk. 
But again, what we can do is this, what we, what's shown is the, the desktop milled microflux or the DMM versus a soft lithography process. So if you were to build this with soft lithography, you might be looking at 70 ish thousands of dollars, whereas the equipment that we run is less than 4,000 for these desktop mill machines. And we can make your microflux for less than $10. And some of the chips are, are around a dollar, two dollars. And you kind of see the feature size. Now, if you need extremely small feature sizes, these aren't appropriate, but for much of the work we want to do, these work just fine. And again, they get turned out relatively quickly. And so again, what I'm hinting at is we're, we're going to be making a service where you can go online, uh, request a device be made, a microflug device, and either have that be run as part of your design at BU or get it sent to you. So this is hot off the, the like, gonna write off hot off the presses, uh, courtesy of, as I mentioned, William working on a lot of the, the computational work. This is kind of a dashboard. This is a real dashboard. This is not just mocked up for this talk, but it's actually running computationally where you can log into the DAMP lab and you can see which projects are currently running. You can see which tasks are scheduled. I didn't tell them to put the little picture of Tiana in the corner, that just happened. So it's got a, it's got a Twitter feed to see what kind of things are coming up related to the lab. Uh, it shows what the status is of the robots and all of that. And so we're really building that infrastructure so you can log in and see what's going on. And you can actually see where your task is queued. Um, you can't read this, but the idea is being that there would also become metrics. This is related to cost. So we're gonna be able to track the average cost per operation, uh, inventory, reagent, sample use. So we can kind of do kind of predictions for inventory management. But then what we're also doing is, is part of the IGSC and other things is providing some biosecurity services. Again, what this is saying in a small font, but you can upload potential services and we can run our own computational tools to do scans on them. And this can also run in the background. So we can provide some other services that people might not have. So we can, the, the point being, this is one computational service, but we might also provide others where the DAMP lab is doing that, not my research group. So the DAMP lab itself might provide computational services. So again, just some examples of some of the projects we're doing. So there's a, an NSF program called the Expeditions in Computing. I was fortunate to, to lead one of those. It's coming to an end this year actually, but it's called the Living Computing Project. The idea of the Living Computing Project is that we want to make digital analog memory and communication based computational models in biology. So again, think of a logic gate in E. coli. In the case, what's shown here is that we are trying to make a sequential logic element. So instead of a nor, an and, an and, we want to make a memory element. It's called an SR latch. It's basically a feedback loop within logic gates that allows that if it's set, it remembers that it's been set. It's going to be an important kind of element for us doing certain systems going forward. And it's composed of different pieces of DNA put together using a MOCLO, this type 2S restriction endonuclease assembly technology uh, that we've developed. And so what we have on the right is the aquarium protocol that's required to put some of these together. So just to put together one SR latch, you can see it's a relatively what at a first glance looks to be a relatively complex procedure. But we're able to do this with what's shown on the right in red in about two to three weeks for this with about one undergrad student and one and really little supervision, that's the vision. So again, we've captured this process of doing level zero, level one, and then putting multiple level one fragments together to make the SR latch with a series of aquarium protocols that we can execute with that kind of McDonald's-esque assembly line. So we're doing that. And then the work that Elijah, one of the experimental technicians that I mentioned is doing is then building up a very large library of these SR latches, going from making a single one to making many of them. And then these become fragments and parts that the computational tools can use to design circuits. Research groups can use them. We can archive and store them. And it kind of vets that our automation process. So he's doing this using kind of that automated but yet manual process. And then what he'll be doing next is transferring these protocols to be able to be run on our robotic platform. So they'll be available. And then what we also do is transfer some of these, the, the actual execution of these circuits to executing in microfluidic environments, which is a whole nother talk, but we're making them amenable to be done kind of traditionally uh, when plated, but also in microfluidic environments. The other thing we do in addition to like kind of cloning and circuit building potentially is doing things like RNA-seq. So Mo Khalil, who's a professor at BU, said, yeah, I want to make use of this service. So he's wanted to go through and, and did 22 samples to do RNA-seq with. Again, it's a series of 
potential uh, uh, aquarium protocols in process. And the idea is again, to be able to get a student to be able to carry this out, go through a standardized process and then us to compartmentalize it and offer it to the community. So I don't know if many of you have heard of coronavirus. It's something that's big in the news right now. Um, I don't know anyone in the world who's not affected by it. Uh, but the idea was, well, testing wasn't going so well and probably still could use lots of improvement. So BU, for any number of reasons, wanted to open back up. So when this all hit it last, I guess, a year ago almost, um, we kind of partially went in, we kind of had halfway classes last spring. Then the summer we, we figured out, hey, we need to get going for the fall. What are we going to do? And we decided that we were going to have students come back in the fall of 2020. But the only way that was possible was for us to test roughly 5,000 staff, students, and faculty a day. So we needed to test 5,000 people a day. And they thought, well, where can we do this? What lab is interested in robots and whatever? And I said, well, that's what my lab does. Uh, just let us know and we'll get the one robot here and we'll go. And then when we went through the process, we realized, well, no, it's not one robot. It's eight robots, five Quant Studio Flex QPCR machines, 30 some full-time staff working in multiple seven hour shifts to do this. And there's, I don't know, there's four or five, I've lost track of the number of collection sites and a huge effort to do that. And so you guys can find out more at the URL in the middle of this slide, but that's what we're doing. And there's a whole process where people go through the, the steps shown on the right, these testing facilities, and then get the results back in 24 hours, even faster than that in most cases. And so the video in the upper left is, is kind of showing what happened to the lab. That was the lab. And then relatively quickly, they started to move everything out and get all of these robots in place. And again, I joke all the time that all it took was a global pandemic for me to get my robots. Um, so if for all the conspiracy theorists out there, you know, I was really <laughs> thinking about why I wanted the robots. Well, this is a way for me to get them. So, but all jokes aside, this is really an interesting time because what it's really doing is it's really helping the public understand the need for us to do high throughput reproducible biology quickly and effectively and how that can affect the whole world. And so the labs have gotten up to speed and you can see in the upper right, again, we're doing RTQ-PCR. There's a manual sample collection process that then goes through an, uh, an activation in, in, a, in, um, in, a warm, in, a, in a warm bead bath because we don't want to wash labels off of tubes and things like that. So the sample gets inactivated, but then it goes to an automated step that involves three robotic stations and then going to QPCR. So there's a process of getting the sample actually put into the right uh, form factor, then doing an RNA extraction with magnetic beads, then ending a QPCR prep mix, and then running QPCR. It looks a little bit like this, where the samples come in in individual tubes, they're scanned, they, they come in, then we end up taking those tubes and getting them put in the 96 uh, sample tubes, getting those put into an RNA extraction process in deep well plates, then putting in a Q, uh, QPCR prep process in, in, in a standard kind of 96 well plates, and then turning those into 384 well plates for QPCR. And again, given the number of robots, the number of samples we can process, we can do upwards of 6,000 tests a day. And so these are kind of stats. There's actually a dashboard you can go to at the URL and you can see how BU's doing. Uh, since July, we've done almost 600,000 tests. Um, you can see that you know we have about a 0.19 positive rate, which is, I don't like to say good because bad, like getting positives are never good, but it shows that we've been, uh, we've done a lot of diligence here at BU and we've had a very uh, safe environment and we've been able to get around and, 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 and isolate those folks. And so I think that's really cool that we were able to execute this so quickly. It was probably the most quick process I've ever seen with the number of people required. There've been some experimental challenges. I wanna make sure I wrap up to stay on time, but there's lots of experimental challenges. There were challenges just getting the barcode heights to be the right, to get to be, to be correct. Do we wanna reuse tips? What labware do we want? Was the labware in stock? What was the supply chain process for this? There are rooms in the building that I'm in that are devoted just to storing tips. Um, so it's, it's a really, there's a supply chain uh, challenge the debugging, et cetera. Then there's lots of computational challenges. We have to decouple user information for HIPAA compliance reasons. So we have electrical medical records that need to talk 
the limb systems. And those limb systems need to be talking to people for inventory and data management. And so my group, you know, was really helpful in setting a lot of this up. And so for the purpose of this talk, to the extent that other people want to learn these lessons or um, and make use of this technology, that's something that we could also help the GBA do. So my last slide is like, what could we do with the GPA? GBA, I, I'd love to. I'd love to interact more and think about what we could do. So one thing I really like to think about is really thinking about shared protocol representation. I know lots of folks on this call and others have thought about that. We're in the process of evaluating what we're gonna to continue to do with Aquarium and what we might do outside of it. We'd love to think about how to represent everything in a shared protocol and how to store it and how to promote it. I would love that there is like the GBA group shared protocol repository that we have where they've been vetted, which equipment this works for, what experiments have been run. And for us as a group to really come together and share and, and disseminate these protocols in, a, in an electronic and formalized way, not snapshots of people's notebooks, but really in an electronically transmittable format. We love to do pilot projects. We're about to kick off a collaboration with BSAF with Paul about pooled COVID testing. And I put question marks there. So if you wanna to try to figure out a, a associated pilot project or collaborate with us, please do so. I'd love to push the tool ecosystem. I've mentioned Aquarium. Some of you know of Symbio Hub. I've now made a tool along with Nick Rohner at BBN Technologies called Knox. That's for storing constraints. And then all the, I mean, there's LBNL and all of the tools Nathan and his group have done. I'd love to figure out how to get Diva and EDD and all of those potentially running at the DAMP lab. I, I have no uh, qualms trying to test those out and get those in our workflow. I think a lab education program would be really cool. Like obviously right now we can't send people around to visit, but some way do we do a rotation and visits and we train each other. So something that I could entertain the thoughts of is if people wanted to attend some uh, seminars that we put on to show you guys how we use our equipment and what we do, I'm happy to volunteer my staff to put some of those on, uh, but we can capture those through this. Uh, we could film them like we're doing the seminar and we could make those available. So that would be pretty cool. And then the last thing is kind of special sessions and demos uh, at IWBDA. So that's a workshop on design automation. Perhaps the GBA could have a couple sessions dedicated or breakouts to that. And I could, I could help that happen uh, through my association with that workshop. Okay, I think that tons of people to thank, particularly the people in the lower right. That was all the people who scaled up and got the uh, testing facility going. Um, so again, I'm a little bit over, but again, thank you all for the time and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks, Doug, that was great. Um, we have a couple of questions um, in the Q&A and, and Tristan um, has been asking both of them. Uh, Tristan, I think you can talk now if you wanna ask your question. Do you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you for a great talk, Doug. That was really interesting. Um, maybe I'll ask my shorter question first, which is you know, when you switched from the DAMP lab to the COVID testing, did you still use all the same software that you had already developed for the DAMP lab? No. <laughs> And, and I would love to say yes, because yes would be the nice story. Right, exactly. But it's, but be simply, like, to be honest with you, because the academic nature of it and some of the prototype, I did not want to be responsible for it crashing on the university. Yeah. And that was yeah. true of everyone. So we actually had to go with a commercial limbs vendor that would have had the bandwidth and uh, frankly, the, I don't want to know the word I'm looking for, but that could be held responsible if sure, the sure. software were to somehow go down and contaminate data and whatnot. So we, we are able to in lockstep test our software and see how it would hold up. But just for the purposes of me going to the president of the university and saying, we got to shut BU down, I didn't want to do that. Sure, sure. And then um, maybe the, the bigger picture question, and you talked about this a little bit, you, you were talking about rotations in the lab, but I was thinking, have you ever thought about, you know, a more formal um, educational program to teach undergrads how to think about automation and how to harness it. You know, you're talking about how biologists don't know <clears throat> how to ask the right questions um, when they have this automation capacity. So, so what can we do to educate like the next generation to think along those terms? Well, the short answer for undergrads are, it's the short answer is iGEM here. So one way we do, we have done in the past, we haven't had iGEM for the past like two years between COVID and me taking a break. But one way would be to continue our iGEM program and educate those undergrads. Mm -hmm. I teach electrical engineering courses. So most of the times I likely won't, I just won't have a chance to teach undergrads to do that. 
but the biological design center at BU very easily could create an undergraduate course where the undergraduate lab session is, is kind of hosted by aspects of the DAMP lab. So that's something that we could look into, but I do have a graduate um, course that you can see at compsymbio.org, like comp, like computing, right. org. That is a graduate level class where we try to get people to think about computational synthetic biology. Um, so the short answer is we should do that and we just need the professor bandwidth and, and, and that to align with the pedagogy of the university. Great, I will check out your, your website. It'd yeah. be interesting to see if there's a lot of, um, yeah, course material for, for teaching this kind of material. There, there is some, and that's the other thing I'd like to push is the, it uses Natalie Kudel from BioBuilders book as well. I'd love to see another textbook. Now I'm not, I'm not saying I'm gonna write one, but I think a textbook could be really cool too. Uh, maybe I'll write it in you know five years or something, but a textbook or something that people could use. Great, thanks. Yeah. All right, thanks, thanks, Tristan and Doug. Um, anyone else have a have a question for Doug before we start wrapping things up? I, I might have a quick one. Can yeah, go, Vince. Cool. Minutes. Yeah. So, so Doug, this is this is really good stuff. As you were talking and describing your platform, it had a lot of flavors of what we've been working on and, and building as well. So the thought that came to, to mind is, uh, you know, as you are doing this and, and many others, uh, we know we're actually building platforms and we're actually trying to think about sustain, long-term sustainability. Um, have you actually looked deeper into what is the, the actual real demand for services like that in a, in a both yeah. in an academic environment and, and, and outside the academia? Um, are we overbuilding here is, I guess, is the question I'm asking. And I don't know the answer. I'm just probing you. So the, the yes, the, so the short answer is the short answer is right now we have trouble getting people to consistently use the service. So I think right now, and I, so the answer is like if I just say, do you want to use the services? There, it takes a lot of herding cats to get even my colleagues to use them. So I think there's a big edge, but then when I give a talk and I explain a little bit what we can do, then then that becomes a little bit more clear. So I think there's definitely an education aspect. I do feel a very, this kind of very analogy to these kitchens where I feel like I go to chefs and say, I have a food processor. And they're like, why would I want that? I'm like, well, because right now you're, you have a restaurant for two people, but if you could cater, you want a catering service and you need that food processor, you need that bigger grill. What would, what would it be if you were to open up your, your, your testing to a larger platform? And so it is an education problem right now. I think it, it, yeah, I, I, I have trouble keeping the pipeline full, and I think there's kind of an education piece. And then there's also, in academia, there's a publication culture where the experimental secret sauce is part of the publication <laughs> fanciness. Right. And so saying that you then did your experiments in a standardized way at a lab doesn't have the sexiness that, I, that you had thousands of grad student hours to pull off this chart. Um, so I think we need to work a little bit on breaking that aspect of the culture and just educating people. I think it's inevitable that this will happen. And, and I think the golden, the silver lining, so to speak, with, with the COVID phenomena is that I think that there's going to be intense and, and increased effort, at least in the U.S., about how to make use of these kind of high throughput techniques after the pandemic. And I think right. that's why having this available would be really great. Are, are you looking uh, Are you looking a little bit, so Agile is doing this, but are you looking also to... Uh to engage in, in startups, emerging companies and things of that nature. We all know that the, the startups always write, try to raise their first $10 million to buy nothing but robots and mass spec and emails. So, so is this something that's in the books for you guys? So I, I'm, I have been fortunate that I'm involved in some startups. So for example, there are aspects of this automation technology and process that is in a company called Asimov. That's a mammalian biologic company that Chris Voigt and I spun out with Alec Nielsen and Raja Srinivas. So the way that this pipeline works kind of will start to make its way into that company, but that company is not gonna expose it like a transcriptic or an Emerald Cloud to say someone else can use it. So I think internally that what you might say is here's some foundry techniques in a box. Now individual labs spin this up internally but I don't know if there's, I don't know about a market to make your own cloud lab, like again, Stratios has tried to do transcriptic. 
I'm a cloud. No, no, I don't no, know. No. What I'm saying is try to work with startups so that they don't have to. Establish. Oh, so like work like a CRO kind of where a little bit like that, right? So yeah, people would make use of the services. Yeah, I think that's possible. I think the big key there in the university setting is that we have to work a lot on IP. So hmm. people are very like, oh, I'm going to send something over and now they're going to know what I'm up to and, and be you making, um, having the legal mechanisms in place to say that that can't happen or shouldn't happen. So some of that would have to be worked on. Right. So, so I think so that thanks. could be really neat. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry to butt in. Doug, if you have time for just one more question, I think we'll, we'll need to wrap it up. Um, Thomas Plochek, do you want to ask your question? You're muted, I think, but I um, think you can talk if you unmute yourself. Okay, I visited both the uh, DAMP lab and uh, uh, Vince Martin's lab. Uh, and uh, uh, with the DAMP lab, you guys are only working with E. coli. And uh, my understanding is to get a project running, I have a number of uh, end products that I'd love to make with uh, synthetic biology, but I apparently need to know the metabolic pathway first, and I don't know how to develop knowledge about the metabolic pathway. So I can't get started. Yeah, you know, the, the short answer, the, well, there is, yeah, I'm not, the short answer is we own, we will only provide certain services right now. Maybe we'll expand them. We do have a certain set of organisms that we'd work with. We're moving to cell free. We have BSL2 space now that's kind of changed with this and we could start to work with mammalian, but we are kind of limited in that space. And you're correct that to the extent that you would need other computational tools or pathway development, we not, may not be set up for all of that. So yeah, the path, pathway development is the area where I have a problem. Uh, yeah. I know the end product, uh, but I don't know how to get to it metabolically. Yes. So, so maybe what I could suggest, Thomas, and this might just be a nice way of signing off. Um, if you have a question like that, I'm sure somewhere in the world, a Global Biofoundry Alliance member could help you with metabolic pathway um, right. development. And I, I just giving our, our pitch for our own biofoundry, Agile Biofoundry, we definitely do that all the time. Um, so if people have questions like that, that's fantastic. You could just send that question to the Global Biofoundry Alliance and we can find a, a biofoundry that would be um, suitable for that. Um, but thanks for the Thank thanks you. for the question. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks again a lot, um, Tiana and Doug, for for being kind of like the first presenters in this in this webinar series. Um, thanks um, to Vince um, to hosting it with me, and thanks for um, to Fabian for um, the support. Um, we'll be um, looking forward to to next month um, for the for the next webinar. So be on the lookout for that, and we'll also get this um, recording posted um, with a link to it off of the Global Biofoundries Alliance um, website. Um, so Fabian, if you want to go ahead and stop recording, um, that would be great.